Some call me Steve, Dad, Husband or Friend. Others might call me Boss, Coach or Mentor. Today you can call me the Leadership Hacker. Thanks for listening in, I really appreciate it. My job as the Leadership Hacker is to hack into the minds, experiences, habits and learning of great leaders, C-suite executives, authors and development experts so that I can assist you developing your understanding and awareness of leadership. I'm Steve Rush and I'm your host today. I'm the author of Leadership Cake. I'm a transformation consultant and leadership coach and can't wait to start sharing all things leadership with you. Our special guest on today's show is George McGarren. He's the founder of the McGarren Group. He's an executive talent acquisition specialist and brand ambassador and ranked amongst the top 30 most connected recruiters in the United States. Before we get a chance to speak with George, it's a leadership happy news. As various parts of the planet return to work and start moving towards getting back into a rhythm of productivity, organizations still suggest that their productivity levels are down roughly 30% year on year because of the way that we are adjusting and getting used to new things. So I'm gonna share with you some top hacks around productivity to help you and your teams start moving your productivity forward. Number one, arrange your day in boxes of activity so you can focus only on that box that you're in. Being out of control and being far forward thinking sometimes creates anxiety, but being in control will mean you stay calm and stay focused. Two, take regular productivity breaks. Our brains can really only work for about 90 minutes full on, and where we'll need to take some time out to recover. Make sure we get those recovery breaks on regular occasions throughout the day so that we can keep our brain focused. Number three, if you have a to-do list, don't put more than five things on it. Just focus on five things at a time and you're forced to figure out what's really important to you, what the priorities are, and therefore discount some of the things that really are wasting space and taking up time. Number four, when you get to read emails, just read one email at once. When you open an email, decide what you want to do with it. You can reply, delete, forward, or archive it. What you can't do though is go back to it later. It just creates anxiety in us and of course it impacts then on our productivity because we know that there's something haunting us for the rest of the day. Get to the habit of doing this isn't easy. It takes a bit of discipline, takes a bit of time. Number five, schedule in distraction time. What do I mean by that? We all know that there are going to be things that we want to look at through the day, maybe Facebook, LinkedIn, things that are going to just curiously drive us to do stuff. Could even be research, right? Aimlessly browsing through Facebook and social media in and out through the day will do nothing but distract us. So plan some time in but use that time to get really focused. So that's it for Leadership Hacker News on this episode. If you have any insights, information, or just some funny stories and you want us to listen to them, please get in touch. I'm joined on today's show by George McGarren. George is the president of the McGarren Group, which is one of the US's top executive placement and recruitment firms of C-suite executives. He's also a professional and executive branding ambassador. George, welcome to the Leadership Hacker podcast. No, I appreciate you having me. Thanks for having me on today. Before you got into the world of executive search and C-suite placement, how did your career take off? Right. So it, it's uh, it's a, a very open-ended question. Back in the day, I mean, I had sort of a normal, you know, I guess you would say, uh, you know, you go to, you know, go to go to decent schools, go to decent universities, get land a, land a job, and then do that for the next fifty years. That was sort of my that was my <laughs> that was what I was taught when I was younger. Um, I I worked for a bit for for. For big four, so for Price, Price Waterhouse, as well as Ernst and Young, and uh, found myself with an opportunity in Miami. I was I'm from originally from uh, the New York area, New York City area. Found an opportunity in Miami, and uh, next thing I know, I was hanging out in Miami for a consulting company. And uh, three months into it, I literally walked into the office. It was a it was a German consulting company, and they said, "Hey, hey guys, we're we're closing down the office, so all of you are." kind of out of work, right? And uh, <laughs> so I found myself unemployed, right? So, you know, I had this sort of very, some other people have called it sort of pedigree background, but I don't, I, I never saw it that way. But, you know, I had this very, you know, sort of strong career going, then I was unemployed. And uh, I found myself literally in the unemployment line. And I don't know if that you've ever had that, 
you know, that aha moment, right? Where you say, where you start to evaluate it and, and you just say, listen, I don't think I want to do this again. I literally in the unemployment line, I decided to, 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 to start up my start a business. I didn't know what business that would be. And uh, the game plan was, you know, and I do, I do executive recruiting, but the game plan was just to go to a bunch of these recruiter guys, get a job, let them finance me for a little bit, and then I could start a company. And, and I walked into a recruiting company. I just thought I could do this easily. And uh, that was sort of it. I worked with, you know, with a for the recruiting firm for a couple months, and then I decided to do my own thing. And next thing you know, I've got, you know, I had a recruiting firm by myself, right? I mean, it was, I say we, but it was me. Right. And uh, so I, that's how I got into it. It wasn't, at the time, it wasn't executive recruiting. It was just very, there's the sort of lower level roles. Um, and I, I did that, built it up to about 50 people, the company. And uh, all of my clients, by the way, were banks and financial institutions. And, and you know, and so this is from like 2000, 2009. And, and one day I got a call from literally all of my clients saying, hey, George, you know, the, the, the world is gone. <laughs> Absolutely right. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, thanks for playing, but you're not welcome anymore. And I went back to, I went from 50 people back to zero. So it's kind of, a, it was sort of a zero to hero back to zero story, you know, for me. Uh, I learned a lot of lessons on the way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, now I've got a 30 person team and I, you know, I, I made a lot of changes in 2008, 2009 that have been packed to, you know, us today, which has helped us quite frankly with this whole coronavirus thing. Um, but that was the, you know, it's kind of a zero to hero, back to zero, back to hero story. If you want to call it that, if you want to paraphrase it. And the work that you do now is about placing top executives, typical salaries, kind of three, four hundred thousand dollars up to five million plus, right? Exactly. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing at the moment. Exactly. And uh, a lot of these executives, I mean, they, they, they run global brands, they run global companies, they have lots and lots of responsibility. We do retain search, which means that a lot of times a company will We'll say we you know we need to replace somebody confidentially and 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 put somebody else in there, uh, and usually it's it's you know it's sort of the I guess in a very cliche way they call it needle needle in, in the haystack recruiting, but it's that's kind of what we're doing, right? We're finding sort of that impossible person, and we're getting retained by these large corporations to to, to find talent for them. They, and usually they either they can't find them find the talent themselves, or secondly, it's it might be too risky, right? From an internal sort of political landscape um, arena. So they they hire firms like myself and we, we compete with, you know, Corn Ferry right. and, and uh, Spencer Stewart and, and that's who we compete with on a global level. So we have clients that are literally in every industry, geography, revenue stream you could think of, but we're working with people that are making from $300,000 a year to four or five million. So it's a, it's a super interesting group. I mean, I can tell you there's a lot of commonalities between, there's actually, there's, there's very few differences between somebody who makes half a million dollars a year and somebody who makes 6 million, which I've found. Yeah, sure. But just a very interesting, very interesting group from a leadership standpoint. And having had all of that experience, we'll pick out some of the key attributes that you observe in some of those that you place too. But also as part of your work, George, you've become uh, renowned on helping people with their branding and placement of their own brand within these organizations. And you, you have that claim to fame that out of all of the Fortune 500 companies, at least one of those executives, you've really helped with their personal branding too, right? Exactly. And that was a that was a mistake turned into a business model. And I don't know if that's ever happened to you on your side, but, you know, just from dealing with recruiting and, and, and you know, folks at that level, they would always come to me and say, hey, George, you know, there's there's sort of a, there's a board role available, or I might, I might be open for another opportunity. Do you know somebody that can that can either take care of my CV or or you know LinkedIn or biography? Um, and they would ask me sort of you know just these questions. Uh, you know, I took on one client and it just it snowballed into you know just a different beast, right? So it's uh, that's more of I guess a B to C play if you call it that. But the the interesting thing about that is some of the some of the B to C business that we get on that. It's it's no it, you know it turns into B two B right because they're running sure you know if I'm introduced to a CEO of a, of a large corporation because the relationship is formed they they then you know be, sometimes become a recruiting client for us um, which is which is the other part of it but it's uh, a lot of these a lot of these folks I mean they they feel very you know kind of lonely at the top right and they feel they they're extremely talented they but they also see the value in coaches and they see the value of getting help you know from with outside sources. Um, and, uh, they, they understand a lot of these, and this is how I see this as well. They understand that maybe, maybe a coach costs, I don't know, 30, 40, $50,000 a year, you could say, right. 
Um, but they understand that they have a five million dollar problem, you know, or let's say they run a ninety billion dollar company in revenue. But they understand they have a bigger problem than just whatever fee they're going to pay to a coach, you know, for some advice. And uh, that's that's one of the common denominators, I would say, about some of these guys and, and girls on the show. Yeah, got it. Yeah. So with all of the leaders that you've worked with over your career, which is extensive across lots of different sectors, what are the key attributes that you observe that your clients are looking for when they hire? Number one, they, they're, I guess the best word is they, they're, they're engaged, you know, and engaged is they, even when they interview or if it's a phone call or uh, even if it's a private or just a personal conversation about how, I don't know, how the family is or how the kids are, um, they're extremely engaged with whatever and focused on the opportunity and opportunity doesn't mean just job opportunity but they're just focused on what they're doing um and i and i think that the reason they're able to be engaged is because they show up very well prepared I, i've had situations where you know where where candidate walked into the client the organization with you know like a 28 page business plan of his here's exactly what we'll do the first you know i mean just it's just it's just they, they just show up very, you know they show up engaged i think that's probably the number one attribute number two they they treat everything as if it's their own business even if it's not and they're they I mean they have so much skin in the game um it's just not it's just not a nine to five gig for them right, right? and that they treat it so a lot, of, a lot of these guys i mean i i always ask the question sometimes i'll say to the you know just in passing you know have you ever thought about just running your own show like why why do this for when i just do your own thing you know, it's, there's a lot of similar, similar things going on. And uh, some of the response will be, yeah, that's my next, that's my next play. Or some of the response will be, well, you know, I really love running a global team. And I love the fact that, I, you know, what I'm doing, I can, I can make it or I can break it. You know, I can, this, this 150 year old company, you know, it's, it's, it's like, I can either destroy them or I can make them something that they were never, they never even imagined, you know, and they, they like that sort of risk. Yeah. There's a bit of a myth, isn't there, that if you're working for an organization, you can't be entrepreneurial, but of course you can. It's just, it's just different bets, right? Oh, of course. Yeah. There are every, I would say everyone at that level is entrepreneurial I and mean, there's not, there isn't really, there isn't one person that isn't. Um, they're, they're all, they're all entrepreneurial. Right. And I think you found that too, dealing with, I mean, you're dealing with very similar people, right. right? In terms of some of the clients you're dealing with. I mean, would you agree that the, I mean, do you think there's a better word than the word engaged? I mean, is that, has that been your experience with some of these folks as well? Yeah, absolutely. If lack of engagement from the very get go means that you, you, you're never going to find that if you haven't got it to start with, right? Right, exactly. And the, well, the other thing too is, and I don't know if you've, you know, what I've noticed is the higher the higher you go up in the chain, the more detailed questions you can ask, and 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 you know, they they really, really, really know their business. And uh, yeah. I think I think I think the ones that are that are sort of you know working on and there's a book on this right the e-myth revisited but the ones that are really working on the business and not in the business you know they have a, just a, a great hold of uh of how to run a, a strong operation right they also understand the value of people yeah you know and it's, it's they think they talk about people processes their people skills are, are, are amazing and uh i was i was i was speaking to somebody uh last week so this this individual he, he runs a company they do about 50 50 billion in revenue right obviously super busy and I was on the phone with him for about 25 minutes. Even on the phone, he, you know, he made me feel like I was the only person in the world, right? When, when obviously he has other things going on. Mm. And uh, I think they have that special leadership glow, right? And that... that it's a connection, isn't it? Totally, totally. And I, I, I've met some, you know, I've, I don't know if you've... I've met some, and I've seen some, some of these world leaders speak, you know, live in person. And they have that spark to them. And, and I think that's one of the things that a lot of the leaders that I deal with, they have this this amazing innate spark and, and, and energy that they make you feel like you're the only person really, you know, that matters in the world, at least for that 25 minutes. And I, I think it's a special skill set. It is for sure. It is. And brand is also a skill. And often people don't perceive that actually building your brand comes with a set of skills. What would be your experience as to what brand means for you and for your clients? Brand can be used in different ways, right? So as a, as a leader, you can use brand from a personal standpoint to to find more opportunities for yourself. You can you can use it, and this is a way that a lot of leaders use it. Brand also is a great talent acquisition tool, right? Where people want to work for interesting people, right? I mean, it's very a very rudimentary, basic sort of way to say it. But by having a strong brand presence, you're also able to attract way better talent than somebody that just has a very you know just a just a kind of a sure. I, don't, I don't know if the word boring is correct but yeah but, but the ones that do a better story and you know sort of that frame their story better and market 
there's their their own personal story as well as the company story in a better light. Um, they just in general they just attract better talent. Um, so you know that's a, that's another piece of it as, as well that some folks don't think about. They think about brand and just in terms of how they can you know how it's how more job opportunities or more um, but partners and vendors and new deals and there's all this other all these other facets of of why brand matters. At the executive level, you know they're 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 constantly constantly selling the vision of the of their company, the culture of their company. It's sometimes the you know the good the good and the bad of their company. Um, so the, the brand piece is extremely extremely important. And I think the ones and this is a change that I've seen in the last ten years. Obviously, thanks to the link LinkedIn. But you know, fifteen twenty years ago, I would never have a conversation with an executive about, hey George. Let's talk about brand or let's talk about my image or let's talk about let's talk about some of the bad news. Right. There's there's, you know, the reputation piece of it. Um, and now that's a it's a common conversation I have with people about the, just their storyline yep. and how they'd like to be perceived. You, you know, you and I are talking from different parts of the world. Yep. And the the market is so it's just a global market. You have to be aware and, and have to control some of that elevator pitch. And I'm not talking about embellishing the story, but. You need to be able to to be aware that somebody from you know I don't know if you're in the states somebody from England might be checking out your LinkedIn profile right or somebody from uh, and your business you know you might be doing business in in Africa uh, through a client that you you know you met in Australia right or but it's just a it's a much smaller market globally. I like the principle of the story being the brand because actually that's how it, it arrived in the first place. If you go back to when we lived in caves fifty thousand years ago, the brand then was just about the emotional connection and the ability for me to tell stories and to hold court and to create that persona. And I guess that's just morphed to the world that we're in now, the corporate world that we're in now, right? No, hundred percent. I mean, there's there's uh, there's I I, I I I was on a webinar yesterday. Um, it was like, it wasn't, it wasn't a webinar. It was one of these, I guess, these Facebook live, you know, events and, uh, they were, they were interviewing me and, and I, I, I didn't say this, but the other, but the, the host did, I just, thought it was an interesting, but they said, you know, perception is reality. Right. And, uh, to some extent that's, that's correct. I think at the executive level though, you have to obviously back it up with proof, <laughs> you know, the proof is in the pudding, but the people will only know about you, what you tell them. Right, especially in with all the access to information and all the noise that goes on and all the you know, I mean it's it's unbelievable in terms of news stories, right? Like if something happens in Indonesia, you and I will find out about it within about two minutes of it happening, right? Now. Mm. Um, you know, six sixty years ago would have been even well, let's say thirty years ago, we we it would have been in the next day, right? Thirty, forty years ago in the paper, maybe maybe. But I, there's just people have so much more access to information and there's and there's this sense of being in an obscurity. Build, being able to build your brand takes you takes you out of obscurity in some sense or another. It does, doesn't it? And also, I think perception is reality to a point. And because we are connected across the world and we've got lots of different mediums, we can validate that much quicker too, can't we? So if I if I think I'm right about this individual, I might double check that and I might look at LinkedIn. I might look at their social media profile. I might read some articles to get to verify and validate whether or not the emotional connection I'm feeling is the right one. Exactly. You know, they call that, I think, social proof, right? And uh, I have, you know, on the branding side, sometimes I'll get referred to people and they, you know, when we start talking about price, and everything else, you know, obviously they'd like, sometimes they'd like to do their due diligence, right? You know, what do they do? They, 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 they go on and I think you've had the same experience, right? They'll go online and they'll just Google me, right? To see what I'm about. You know, some, some people don't pass the Google test, right? And some people do. So you have to be conscious of that now um, as well. I mean, even, even this podcast, for example, that, you know, that, that you and I are on later on, if we Google each other's names, I mean, we'll show up on Google, right? As part of the, you know, it will show up as a, as a link. That's right. So you have to be conscious of that. You know, I guess, I don't know if it's a play, but I think you have to be conscious of the things that you do and also the things that you don't do. I mean, you have to be careful of what you say and don't say sometimes it will get out very, very quickly and sometimes in the wrong way. Yeah. We, by the way, we, as a service, and we, we were thinking about this because just because people are asking for it, they're asking now, executives are saying, hey, George, you know, how do I repair some of my reputation, right? Because sometimes, I mean, you know, like a 25, 30 year career, you've got sometimes you have employees that weren't happy, things happen, maybe, maybe negative news, right, with the company. So as, a, as an ask, you know, we're, we're thinking about offerings a service, rep, it's, you know, almost like a rep, reputation repair, you know, for executives. Uh, because it's, it's like I said before, a lot of these folks have a half a million of, you know, five, four to five million dollar problem, you know, one ding. And when you're looking people up is a problem.
right? I think as you know, I think you and I are sort of old enough to realize you also have to deal with the person, see what your take sure. is, you know, because sometimes yeah. people get, you know, what's out there is not always true, right? Yeah, absolutely right. That's very true. And also people do screw up with good intention too, don't they? And as long as we've used that as a learn in our life, and that's been a positive experience for us, then we shouldn't necessarily come with that worldview that because something's gone wrong in the past, it means it'll go wrong in the future either. Well, I think that's the only way to learn, right? And, uh, you know, this is this is just to, just to give you a my story. Um, so we've got 30 people. The recruiting is an eight-figure business. The the branding piece is a seven-figure business, right? On those fronts, but you know, I think everybody has those. It, it, when I when I, when I had to let go of the 50 people in 2009, um, you know, I also lost uh, three houses <laughs> in the, as well, right? Yeah, right. So you know, it just everybody that has done, you know, if you've done even remotely well, I'm sure you have. I don't, I don't even, you know, I used to feel like it was a skeleton in the closet, but I feel like it was a learning, you know, you, you learn how to deal with things and uh, everybody has that story. That That's what I've noticed, right? The ones that take risk. Demonstrates an element of resilience, that bounce back ability or whatever it's called. Yeah. And, and you also learn to suck up your ego, right? Your ego is, is uh, you, you have to learn how to, but everybody has that in their background. I think the ones that have done, that have taken risk and you can see this two ways, right? You can see it as, okay, the guy failed. Or you can see it, the guy failed, but he got up and, and he did it again. You know, but that's, the, it's just social media and, and the brand and all of this comes into play. Also for candidates, and this is just, you know, for people that have kids out there who are in the university, you, you have to be careful of your kids' brands, you know, your, your children, sort of their brand as well on Facebook and, and Instagram and everything else. Because employers, you know, look at this and they look at this, they, they, they look to see, you know, kind of what they're what what they're up to before they hire somebody. So it's even you know it's it's also important for somebody who's younger, who who thinks that maybe the maybe they think this show doesn't really you know this show doesn't you know doesn't matter to them. Um, but if you're you know if you're in your fifties and six you know if you're in your fifties let's say and you've got some kids that are finishing university, their 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 next employer hundred and ten percent I know for a fact they'll be looking them up in Facebook and Instagram and see what they're up to right before they even make a decision to even to even interview them by the way not even just to see if they so they'll look at the CV they'll look at the LinkedIn profile of course yeah but then they'll look at the other social media you know obviously TikTok and other things that are showing up now you know you have to be very careful as a younger person as well and I I, I see this as a mistake a lot of the younger people are not being careful because I just think there's a sense of immaturity they they don't realize that in 30 years from now you know, they're going to, all these things will pop up and their kids will probably ask them certain questions, you know, about them. And I wonder if you notice whether or not employers are looking at parents, siblings, the, the social connectivity, does that feature now as part of, you know, who you're connected with? Does that play out at all? I, I would, I would say directly, no, it's say indirectly, I would say indirectly kind of, you see kind of who's some, who was in someone's circle. We, we were referred to hire somebody on our, on our team for an inside, inside sales role. And, um, it was a referral on, you know, from a Facebook group that some, one of my team members was on. So then you can see who, you know, you can see the profile, you can see who, who, who they're connected to and, and, and some of the comments. To be fair, I think it gave it the wrong impression of the person, right? Because you can kind of see the circle of people that they hang in, right? And, and uh, so, I mean, I don't, I don't think it's a tool that people directly look for yet, but indirectly, you know, I'm sure it plays a little bit. I mean, it did for us, at least even for a basic inside yeah. sales role. It's part of that social proofing, isn't it? It's part of that validation. And maybe that goes back to a larger theme about sort of classism and, right, and 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 judgments of people before you even know them and, sure. and where people come from. And, are you know, if you, if you, I, I have a friend of mine, by the way, this is an interesting, he's a, he's a multimillionaire, right? He grew up literally with nothing and he... He literally, you know, he moved out of, he grew up in this very poor area. Um, he, he literally, you know, he has, he has business relationships, he does very well. But all of his friends, his like inner circle, they're all his buddies from where he grew up. And he refuses, refuses, even if you go, I was invited to a, to a, to a, to a baptism um, from a friend of a friend. And, and, and he, he just, he refuses to even justify, you know, like he hasn't changed his, his, his inner circle is, is the same as it, when he grew up. And, uh, you know, and I, I tell him sometimes, you know, I don't know who's right or wrong, right? Like maybe he's got it right, but he's he's able to be himself sometimes. But I'm I'm sure I'm sure, you know, I'm sure they've you know, he's probably lost business opportunities because they're because of sometimes, you know, the people he's hanging out with. Yeah. And they're they're nice people. It just it just people make these judgments about others without knowing much about them. 
he, he's like the typical rags of riches story. He just happened to keep the friends, you know? He didn't get rid of the friends. I was out in uh, San Francisco doing some business a few years back and bumped into a venture capitalist and we were having a coffee. And the one thing that resonated with me that kind of stuck with me from that point on was your net worth is equal to your net work. Right. So if you've got a broader network, it's diverse and it can help support your growth of your business. That's more like to help you succeed. And conversely, of course, if it's very narrow and very short. Well, it's also it's also the mindset, right? It, it's the mindset of of uh, of who you hang out with sometimes, and sometimes the mindset. I mean, I find that as well. I mean, every every client that we have now in recruiting is based on a relationship. It's it, it wasn't because I or somebody on my team sent the best, you know, sort of best email ever, you know, or it was the best, <laughs> you know, it was the best call. Um, it's mostly because of relationships, right? So there, there's a by the way, there's a there's a for some of your listeners that have you know businesses. There's a model. That, I mean, I call it the pay-to-play model, where you can join some of these some of these exclusive clubs, or you can join, you can go, to, you know, to some ex- exclusive restaurants, or you can you can you know even politically, there's that pay-to-play model, and that's what people are doing, right? They're they're paying for access to 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 make sure that their net you know their net worth is connected to their network, right? And uh, I think that's what that's what people do. And, mm-hmm. you know, I, and I have a coach that I work with. And that was one of the recommendations he had made is like, listen, you got to a certain level. Maybe maybe you now move to the pay to play model. Really interesting. Yeah. Instead of, you know, you can get pretty much your whole core audience right in one room, <laughs> you know, through a, a three thousand dollar dinner, you know, maybe like, in you know, for, for some sort of negotiation. Right. You have everybody there rather than spending 15 years to try to make that network up right so it then can seem quite cost effective marketing in many respects then can't it of course but it, you're, you're totally right that you, you, i see that a lot right your network is your is your net worth it, it's it's fairly true it's fairly true I, I think i think to 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 digress on that though a little bit is you have to you have to give to people and this is a networking tip but you have to give to people you know give 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 before you take and uh i think the ones that play that you know the me 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 game it doesn't really work out well for them later on no trust either right no trust yeah it's just i mean you've had that you've had that call right sure. where it's just you know where you had that you've been at a dinner party and it's you know it's it's it's, it's but the ones that give and there's a there's a it was a book written i think in the 20s 1920 so it's called think and grow rich by napoleon hill this gentleman he for 25 years of his life literally all he did was interview extremely famous people, wealthy people, successful people. And he, and he, and he, and he created this book for sort of common denominators of, of all these. And that's all he did. He little, his life passion, his life mission was to interview these people. And, uh, he, he talks about one of the, he talked about all the secrets to some of these folks, uh, success. And one of it, one of the pieces was the, the law of, I think, I mean, I might be paraphrasing it wrong, but it's a re- reciprocity, right? The law of reciprocity. Yeah, for sure. Right. Where I give you five or six people, right? Eventually, you know, things come full circle and you'll, you'll start throwing things my way and, 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 and being genuine about it. And uh, I think that's a, you know, I think if you can brand yourself as well as you want, but you also need to be, in terms of networking, you know, you need to be conscious of that, of that rule. And uh, it's a great, it's a great book, by the way. Uh, he also talks about, which you, you've seen all these masterminds pop up in the last five, 10 years. I mean, you've seen yeah. that everywhere, right? Yeah. So the original, um, the original idea or I guess concept actually comes from that book. Um, so it was, uh, I think it's, I think it's the number one, one of the most sold book ever, you know, business self-help book ever. I think it's, I, I think, I don't, I don't know if there's another book that sold more copies than that book. So it's, it's a terrific book. So think, think and grow rich by Napoleon Hill written in like 1920s, but it's, there's so many things that are relevant to today. Still holds true. Oh, oh yeah, mm. it's, a, it's a terrific book. Thinking about then having created my brand, I've been really thoughtful about the stories I'm going to tell, and I'm, I'm now going to take me to market. How do I do that without appearing needy and without appearing that I'm selling and or overselling myself? Well, I, I think the first thing, and this is this sounds, I mean, pretty basic, right? But I think you need to think about what is your end game and and what kind of client is your end game and and who you're selling to. I think that's the that's the first piece, right? Is like if, if you're I mean, you know, in our case, we target executives. So our, our, our messaging is a little different than if I were tar- targeting, I don't know, 18 year old kids, right? Or 17 year old kids. So I think the first piece is you need to figure out who your audience is, right? Before you even start. The second thing is, I mean, I see this problem a lot, right? So somebody will start, you know, they'll, they'll start a YouTube channel and a LinkedIn page and this page and that page. 
and then they they don't do anything. You know, they 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 work it hard for about three weeks and then they leave it alone. I think the second piece is consistency in terms of the brand. So I think you need to constantly you need to be out there and active. And that's that's a way not to screw it up. The third thing is I, I highly recommend this. I mean, you need to fish where the fish are. If your your brand, you might be able to tell your brand better in a Facebook group, right? You might be able to tell it better in a LinkedIn group. It, it you need to fish where the fish are and and where the correct fish are. So make sure you do, you know, do your research to figure out where your audience is hanging out. And then I would I'd probably dig in and with one one, you know, one platform and, and just be the be the subject matter expert without taking. Just give advice, 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 advice. I think there's a technique where they they'll go in and they'll answer a question, right, about something. And then they'll say, Well, how do I know the answer to this? They'll say, Well, I'm you know, I know this answer because I run a successful executive branding company. That's how I that's why I'm able to give you some career advice. There's no sales thing, you know, like if you need advice, call me. It's just you're just a very subtle PS. I'm giving you this advice because this is what I do for a living. And that's a that's a great way to call I call them brand gifts. Yes. In other words, I'm going to give you a gift of information and I'm expecting nothing back in return. So uh, I've saw this. It's yours. Here's my gift of information, of insight. Uh, and it strikes them as thought leadership as well, doesn't it? A hundred percent. But you, you, you need to make sure that you're giving the advice to the right people, right? Like you're not, if you're a vegetarian, you know, giving... Or, you know, you're not, you, if you're, you know, if you're, let's say you're a meat eater, you're not, you need to make sure that you're in the right group, right? So it, it, it's, uh, yeah, and, and maybe the, maybe advice, the advice is spot on, right? But you have to make sure that you're, what you and I are talking about right now for a 17 year old is, is probably, they're 17 going on 34, right? You have to make sure the audience is correct as well with your, with your brand. I think that's the one thing I think, I think one of the big mistakes is people, they sell this brand like, they're going to conquer the 7 billion people in the world. And I don't, I don't know if you need to conquer 7 billion, conquer the, you know, conquer the 300 people that might buy, you know, that might, you know, buy your product later on. Sure. So at this part of the show, George, I'm going to ask you to turn the lens a little inward now and, uh, and learn from your leadership. Cause whilst you've been an ambassador and advisor and a coach to some of the top us execs, what would be your top leadership hacks that you would share with our listeners? And this is this is what I do, and this is what other folks, sort of very well paid executives, do. Um, I would say they're experts at delegation. I mean, and just without fact, just they're just experts at delegation, right? So I think the first thing is, you know, figure out what you make hourly. If you really want to think about, it, you can divide it by two thousand eighty hours of work hours in a year. Let's say you'd like to make a, I don't know, let's say you'd like to make a million dollars a year. That's five hundred dollars an hour, roughly. Be be conscious of that task, you know, of even a basic thing like email. Right, you know, one hour of email for you would cost about five hundred dollars. You could probably find somebody cheaper for twenty to thirty dollars an hour, right? So be they delegate, but with a purpose. They know exactly what their hour, hourly rate. They know what their costs are, right? They know what their hourly rate is. The second thing I would say is, so I'm, I'm a big fan of the eighty twenty rule. I mean, I'm you know focus on three two or three things that you're great at, and then the rest let somebody else do it. Uh, that's the second thing, you know. And, and if you get caught in doing things that you're not great at, then don't do it. And that, that that drives revenue unbelievably well, uh, and and the third thing is I think you just need to let go. Like you need to not micromanage your team. Let your team develop their own skill set. Let your team develop their their own habits. You, you'll find eventually that they they can do the task much better than you can. And uh, well, I was joking. I was on a call a couple of days ago, and I had to log into a website. I, I didn't know the password to my own my own Gmail account. Right? But, you know, we use. Uh, we used Google Google business you know apps for the for the for the uh, for the business, but business account I didn't know my own Gmail password because my team manages my email right, so I don't I don't do email, um, but you need to let go and let some let other people do some of these these administrative tasks. I think that's the number one thing I see for for entrepreneurs and, and leaders. They just the ones that are like in the weeds. It just doesn't 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 fare well for them later on. Super great advice. Thanks, George. So this part of the show, we've affectionately call it Hack to Attack, and it's where we were able to explore with our guests on the show times where they may have screwed up, things haven't gone well, but they've used that as a learning experience. Now, you've intimated a couple of those already on the show today, but what would be your Hack to Attack? Right. So it's things I messed up on. I mean, number one, and I learned this the hard way, you know, 2000, 2009, cash flow. Cash, I mean, cash flow is king, right? So always, you know, you can't, if you, if you have no, you have to make sure they have some sort of reserves, uh, you know, so cash flow is, cash flow is king. The other mistake that I I made constantly, you need to be very, you need to slow to hot, you know, be slow to hot. I know you've heard this before, but be very slow to hire people, but you know, fast to fire. I think you know the hiring process. You need to take your time and do your due diligence and make sure you get the right person because it's it's a 
it's a disaster when they don't work out well, right? So my our retention, my our, my team's retention rate. I mean, I haven't had somebody leave in literally. It must be like six years now, mm. uh, and we haven't had to let anyone go. Um, it's just because we we took our time to hire people, right? So it has to be that number. That was the number two mistake that I made over and over. I mean, I mean, I must have made that mistake a hundred times, right? Hiring the wrong people very quickly because mm-hmm. I like the guy or the girl or I just thought they were cool and they were you know energetic and they just didn't have the skill set. And the third thing is to have diversity in your clientele, right? So just don't get sucked into like I did the banks or don't get sucked into one type of, you know, you need to have a different type of portfolio so that yeah, if one industry, you know, sort of hits the fan, you, you've got another industry to fall upon um, from a revenue stream standpoint. That, those are three things. So cash flow, be careful to hire too quickly. Uh, and then number three is is diversity in your portfolio, in your client portfolio, right? So just don't have one type of industry. All of these three things literally cost me two years of my life, right? Because it took me two years to rebuild, right? So I, I wish I knew, you know, just disasters that problems I don't have now, but problems I had because I didn't didn't have that advice. Big lessons well learned as well. Oh, yeah. Final thing we want to do with you, George, is just explore a little bit of time travel. And I'm going to ask you to bump into George at 21. What would be the advice that you would give him? I mean, at 21, my stupidity was greater than my intelligence. <laughs> so, so I would I, I would say, you know, maybe be wiser to the people that have, you know, they were giving you great advice and, and listen to them a little more and understand that they've they've been around for, you know, 40, 50, 60, 70 years. So they might, uh, I would say, listen to listen to some of the older advice. Uh, number two is, especially as a business person, as, even if you if you work for a company, focus on process improvement and focus on, to some extent, automation, right? Where everything today is really a big math problem and most of it comes down to process improvement, right? And continuous improvement. And if you can slowly improve something, you know, 1%, 1%, 1%, then later on, and you know, and then the third thing I would say would be to make sure that you take, I, I probably take more risk, you know? I mean, I, I think I was a little too safe with some of the things I had done. Um, I would have thought a lot bigger than I, you know, like... You know, for me, thinking big was I'm going to make 200 grand next year, right? And then I made 200 grand, and it's like, okay, I'm going to make 300 grand, and then I'm going to make 500 grand. You know, I never thought, oh, let me make 100 million dollars. You know, I mean, let me make 300 million. And uh, I think if you're an entrepreneur, just you need to think bigger. And I would do that all over again. And you know, if I could, I'd think bigger. That's great advice, and I'm sure those people listening um, can resonate with that too. Final thing I want to spin through with you is that, firstly, it's been super chatting with you george it's been really fascinating you've got a super handle on branding and placement and it, it goes without saying that you know in order to get into the space of competing at the top us executive search firms uh, you get a lot of this right if people wanted to connect with you from today uh, whether they be future clients or indeed people just interested in the work that you do how can they best do that right so they could just so there's two ways so first way is just to send a basic email right they can email us um it's just at george so it's george g-e-o-r-g-e at and then my surname right mcgarin m-c g-e-h-r-i-n group.com that's the first way uh the second way is in the uh my linkedin is literally has thirty thousand connections on it so we're it's maxed at linkedin so now we're moving things to, to instagram but instagram is it's just exec underscore headhunter right so it's e e x e c underscore headhunter uh and that those are the two ways and they could just google you know they could just google me if they spell it 75 percent correctly then they'll find me george we'll make sure that we put all of your contact details in our show notes uh, along with your email address as long as with, with your instagram handle too so that when folk are finished listening to us they can click on them straight away and bump into you much quicker than having to search through google uh, and from my perspective i'm just delighted that we had the opportunity to meet george and thanks ever so much for appearing on our show today i wish you every success with the mcgarren group and what happens next steve no i i i, I appreciate it thanks for having me on and, and you're, you're doing great stuff and uh, I, I appreciate all, all that you're doing for everyone else as well so thank you for that thank you george I genuinely want to say a heartfelt thanks for taking time out of your day to listen in too. We do this in the service of helping others and spreading the word of leadership. Without you listening in, there would be no show. So please subscribe now if you haven't done so already. Share this podcast with your communities and network and help us develop a community and a tribe of leadership hackers. And finally, if you'd like me to work with your senior team, your leadership community, keynote an event or you would like to sponsor an episode please connect with us via our social media 
and you can do that by following and liking our pages on Twitter and Facebook. Our handle there is at Leadership Hacker. Instagram, you can find us there at the underscore leadership underscore hacker. And at YouTube, we're just Leadership Hacker. So that's me signing off. I'm Steve Rush, and I've been the Leadership Hacker.